we have first have a, in an overview of the industry. Steve Valji addressed this more specific issue, which is the integration of the electric sector and the separation of risks. The risk of ethanol and sugar on the short run is one, and the electric energy risk is a different one. And this is a, an industry that has a very long-term maturing period. And this is the way we think. I come from this industry. You can't think of having a return on a project of energy in two or three, five years. So now we're going to listen to Sergio Granvilli, who will probably talk about uh, more of a technical aspect. Since he works at PSR Consulting, and he's the technical director. He's a mathematician with the master's and a PhD in optimization by Stanford University. He's also a technical director of BSR, which is a company from uh, energy sector. It's a Brazilian company that have uh, operates worldwide as well. I have received some questions already. I would uh, urge you to please send them in writing up here so we can then have a Q&A session. Good morning, everyone. I would like to thank for the invitation. Thank you for the invitation on, be on behalf of PSR. And I would also briefly talk from the point of view of the energy sector. Brazil has a very clean energy matrix. Um, about 44% of our power comes from renewable sources. And the energy or the electric sector is even cleaner because 75% of its installed capacity, data of 2008, and 95% of the generated power comes from uh, hydroelectric power plants. Most of uh, the thermal plants are flexible, and so they don't dispatch most of the time. So we have the hydroelectric power plant cover up for the shortage of energy. In the last uh, five years, two new sources of renewable energy were added to the system, bioelectricity and the small hydro plants, known as PCH. Many PCH plants were a added to the system, around 5,200 megawatts installed. And more recently, another renewable source of energy was added, which is the wind energy. Why is bioelectricity attractive? Because traditionally, the Brazilian hydroelectric plants was based on major and great projects such as Itaipu, Madeira, Santo Antonio, and Giral, which uh, have a around 3,500 installed megawatts. And another 11,000 megawatts expect to be auctioned. But the problems with these plants are that they are very large. We have environmental issues and difficulties in the financing. The, uh, the number of investors is very small that have the amount of finance. Additionally, they take long for constructions. It takes five years to build a large plant. What is the advantage of uh, bioelectricity? It's diversification. You have the portfolio effect. You have a wider range of investors that might participate. You have a shorter construction time. And you also have easier environmental license. This is quite interesting. This decentralization in relation to the growth of the load of 
the system that generates some uncertainty. You can add more plants to the matrix to meet the increase in the load. It is the opportunity, it's a window of opportunity by electricity based on the perspective of on the sugar cane harvest for the production of ethanol and sugar. We have more than 340 million tons up to 2015 or 16, and the construction of 90 new sugar cane plants. We have here a perspective of the sector. The first car uh, tests with ethanol. In, in the 70s, we have the Pro Alco, and more recently, the flex fuel cars. As you can see here in the graph, the explosion of the flex cars in Brazil, representing more than 90% of the Brazilian fleet, and the explosion of uh, alcohol for consumption. This was already discussed here where we are planting sugar cane, you have a huge potential of land to expand the planting area. Uh, here is the process of cogeneration. You have the several stages of cogeneration. And it's a competitive source if we see it properly, as Professor Nivaldo mentioned. Given you have a growth in production of ethanol and sugar, the cost to produce bioelectricity is the cost of using a more efficient boiler and a generator tube with a higher capacity for generation. So you have a simple rule that 10 average megawatts per million of tons of cane. If you consider the perspective of growth in the harvest, 340 million tons, this can add to the system 3.4 thousand average uh, megawatts. This is almost is the same capacity of the two mega hydro projects of Santo Antonio in Geral in the Madeira River who were recently that were recently auctioned. With the existing retrofit of straw, uh, it's an, a new Itaipu. Here's the result of the auctions that show the growth of bioelectricity, uh, average megawatts added to the system. These data are based on the auctions for distributors who that are public auctions. There are lots of auctions in the free markets which uh, we are not considering. The, moreover, the reservoirs is very important for hydropower because because you have a hydropower park uh, that is large, it is able to absorb a production that happens during certain periods of the year and will happen during the dry season. So hydropowers with their reservoirs can produce more during the rainy season and bioelectricity will give back this energy when it, it is more needed, that is during the dry season. An additional aspect of bioelectricity is related to the to what happened in this addition of these fossil fuels in Brazil, as Professor Nivaldo mentioned, because of a balance of the para parameters used to calculate the competitiveness of the plants in the auctions, there was an increase of plants with fossil-based plants. And we added to the system 10 
1,000 average megawatts of thermal capacity. This represents Santo Antonio, Giral, Belo Monte, Angra, Três, and Furnace plants, which is a lot. What is the result? The uh, con uh, consequence is that we'll have an increase on CO CO2 emissions, as we show here in the graph. millions of carbon emissions and the cost of this energy because these thermal plants are higher by availability, fuel cost is being refunded by distributors. So in our power bill as of 2010, 2011, there will be a huge increase. We'll have an increase of PLDs because these plants The average of supply is very small. It will contribute to reduce the level of reservoirs. There is an increase in the cost in the short term, an increase in the power bill, and a higher volatility of short term prices. Here we show, for instance, you remember uh, we showed here in 2016 50. 4 billion tons in average. But if you consider what might happen in terms of hydro scenario, 54 in average. But if we have uh, a low level of rain, this might be much higher, reaching almost 140 billion tons of uh, carbon. With this, at PSA here, we built a new scenario for 2009 up to 2020. This is a very conservative uh, proposal that we will have just more 4,000 megawatts of uh, firm energy or bioelectricity, con considering an average 500 megawatts average per year. This bioelectricity in this scenario, it will displace this uh, future thermal generation. And we are going to study the impact of this in terms of operational costs and emissions. With the introduction of bioelectricity, we will have more energy during the dry season. It's a firm energy, it can firm the reservoirs, and PLTs will, short-term prices will be less volatile, and it will replace new thermals, it, and will make that the existing thermals it reduce their emission levels. This will imply operational economy in terms of 20,000 hectares. Or over 20 billion high, sorry. It will imply a reduction of emissions because the thermal will have a low uh, reduction in the emission level, and this emission uh, reduction, as shown here, added to the value of tons of uh, CO2 represents a saving of 5 billion hairs for the power sector. Therefore, bioelectricity is very competitive in both price and quantity. There is a synergy between uh, bioelectricity and hydro plants in terms of 